Swim check one, two. Bike check one, two. Run check one, two. I think we're ready. Let's try this. Welcome to the Try Beginner's Luck podcast, a podcast where we explore the sport of triathlon from a variety of perspectives to help beginner triathletes on their journey. I am your host, Nishanda Shines. Welcome to another edition of Try Beginner's Luck. I am so, so honored to close out the month with this gentleman. Let me give you a little bit of backstory before I bring him in. I met this gentleman in 2015 at my first marathon. Mind you, just like your first Ironman or first triathlon or first sprint or first anything, you're a little bit nervous and not always in the right headspace. So this particular year of Marine Corps Marathon, they implemented uh, security checks. And even if you got there early, you still had to go through these security checks. And so I go through the security checks line and it just felt like the line wasn't moving. And so I'm freaking out because in my mind, again, you guys have learned, are starting to learn me. I like to plan and I like, I know where I need to be so that I can set myself up for success. I knew I needed to start before my corral so that I could have enough time and not be with buses that I'd heard about. Well, that's not what happened. (laughs) Jesus, that is not what happened. Because there was such a delay, I didn't even get to start until moments after the race had started and then had to go in and look. And this particular gentleman was there to calm me down and be like, look, it's going to be okay. You're going to be good. And he had on this outfit. And I was just like, wow, he has an outfit on that's green. It's bright. It's vibrant. Just was kind of confused. But I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. And he's like, yeah, I'm a coach. And I was like, oh, okay. So this gentleman is none other than Mr. Lloyd Henry, who is the on point fitness coach owner. He's the head coach. Lloyd is an amazing athlete himself. I'm going to give you a little bit about him up front, and then we'll talk more about his accomplishments at the end. But let me just say that he is the first African-American to finish an Ironman on six continents, plus the Ironman World Championship in Kona, Hawaii as of 2016. What? That is an amazing, fun Black history fact for the sport of triathlon. I get to welcome in none other than Mr. Lloyd Henry. Lloyd, welcome to Try Beginner's Luck. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good to be here. I am so excited to have you here. So let's get right into it. Do you remember that person that you met in 2015? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, you know, it, you're a vastly different athlete now than you were then. You, you've definitely grown into, into the sport. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Because before your interview, I happened to just go back into my pictures and I looked at my, a picture that we took and I was like, ooh, yeah, you are a whole different person. And the fact that you said that, I think just speaks to my growth. So come on here for growth and not being the same. So that's increase. And so I just felt like I should start off with that because sometimes people, we can oftentimes forget where we start. Absolutely. And that's the one thing I don't ever want to do. I know from which I've come from and I don't ever want to forget it. However, I don't want to bask in it either. I want to be able to look at it and grow from it. But I remember that athlete. I remember that person. And I'm glad that I'm a better person myself today and just a better athlete all around because I'm more knowledgeable and knowledge brings confidence as what we heard from one of my guests in season one is that the more knowledge you have, you are more confident. And to that point, I want to add to his quote is that you're able to make better decisions. That's true. You're able to make better decisions. So tell me about your athletic journey, because what I find is that you started your athletic journey as an adult. Yes. So so for me, uh, I've got no athletic background to speak of 
before I started to do multi sports. So, you know, you finish college, finish grad school, uh, you start working, you know, you, you follow that path and you just kind of get, I got settled into my normal, you know, this is life. And here in the, the DC area, you're all, you got to catch the Metro to go everywhere. So I'd always catch the Metro to work. And, you know, years of that, all of a sudden I realized like it was hard to catch the Metro. Like you'd see the Metro coming and you start running to try to catch it. And, you know, over the course of the years, it's like, yeah, you could leave home a little later and still hustle to catch the Metro. And then it came to a point where it was like, yeah, I'm gonna just let the, I'm gonna catch the next one. I'll be a few minutes late for work because you just missed that one. You couldn't run and catch it anymore. And, you know, so I was way down on that road of like, uh, I'm just gonna catch the next one. It was, there was no ability to hustle <laughs> to catch the Metro. Um, and, you know, I was still relatively young, you know, late, late twenties, early thirties. And, you know, I, I ran into my family and we talked about it of being sedentary at a young age. So that prompted, you know, one of my siblings to challenge me to do a triathlon. And, you know, like every, every good story always starts with a dare. My sister challenged me. I was like, I dare you to do one, you know? And I was like, sure. What's the big deal? I know how to swim ish. I can bike, I can run, what's the big deal? So <laughs> that's what I did. I, I, I started to train, I got back in shape and then I went and did my first sprint triathlon and it was amazing. So I pretty much got hooked off of that very first try just by somebody daring me to do it. You know, it takes a good sister to, to give you a good try. So I love your sister already for putting you up to a challenge because that challenge has allowed you to change the lives of so many people. Um, and she probably just was like, he ain't going to do it. And then you did. That is true. And I mean, I got her back because years later I made her do one. Mm, so I need to get her on here to figure out how her experience was. So that's a note to self. Awesome. So 2003, you do this tri sprint triathlon. Where was the sprint triathlon? And tell us about what was going through your mind in 2003. So take yourself back. So 2003, uh, the race was the St. Croix sprint triathlon. I'm originally from St. Croix, born and raised. So it, it was always fun to go home. We always had the, growing up, we had the triathlon in St. Croix, but no one looked like me in the race. So we would always go and volunteer at the event. You know, as school kids, you'd hand out water um, cups and all that kind of stuff as a volunteer. And we'd see all of these tourists descend on the island for the triathlon, for the sprint and the half Ironman at the time. And it was just like, you know, who are these folks who are just coming in and doing this thing? And we just laugh because it was just like, this is crazy. So, you know, growing up seeing that, it was never of interest. But now, you know, that was the benchmark my sister set of coming back to do that particular event. So flew home, uh, you know, had to take a bike down, get situated. And the, the beauty of this particular race is the starting line is on the key. So there's a little island, a key in the middle of the wharf. So you have to literally swim from the dock in St. Croix over to the key. And the race starts from there. Now, the backstory is as a kid, everyone dreamed about even just being able to swim from downtown Christiansted Wharf over to the key. So it's one of those things where you knew someone who knew someone who had a friend or a cousin, one of the big kids who made that swim, but you didn't personally know anyone. It was always like a rumor or lore of, you know, these big kids who were able to swim that distance. So, you know, the thought of just swimming, that was the challenge. So to start the race, you jump in, you swim over to the key, uh, and then you get ready for the race to start. By the time I got to the starting line, I felt like I had won already because I had accomplished like the biggest thing, you know, even to this day, you know, how many Ironman races later, if I go home, all I have to say is I've swam from the wharf to, to the key. And that's like, wow, that's, you know, that's an athlete right there. That's a great swimmer, you know, because that that's, 
putting it in context of how big of a feat that is, you know, growing up perception wise. Um, but so time for the race to start. Um, you line up. I'm excited. I think I know how to swim. Gun goes off, jump in the water, and I'm swimming, swimming. You know, the beautiful water is crystal clear. And of course, you start to uh, feel the other swimmers, a foot here, an elbow here, you know, someone tugging on your leg there, all kind of experiences that you've never had while you're doing laps in a pool. But it was kind of weird and, you know, <laughs> threw you for a loop, but wow, this is, this is interesting. <laughs> Now I see why I've never done this before, you know, Thanks. but, um, you know, so here we, you're, you're swimming straight out into the middle of the ocean, uh, right into, you know, the Caribbean Sea, and you're just going off like you're heading into nowhere until you get to the turn buoy to turn back to head towards, towards shore. Uh, then you come out of the water, you know, when I got out of the water back at the dock, and they pulled me out. I was like totally punch drunk, running in transition. You know, I'm smiling, but I'm in a daze because I am like super exhausted, but excited because I did the swim. So I'm just like trying to find my bike. I get to my bike. My bike is the only bike left in transition in, in that section, but who cares? You know, back then it, you would always leave like something to mark your bike. So I had my balloon. Uh, you know, attached to the bike rack so that if I ran into transition and saw hundreds and hundreds of bikes, I would be able to find my bike. <laughs> but <laughs> since my bike was virtually the only bike left in transition, it was like, oh, there it is. So I ran, got my bike, my family, uh, my friends, they're all cheering, you know, like, wow, he did it. Great. You know, I get on the bike and I'm riding. Uh, that one, I think it was about a 12 or 13 mile bike ride through downtown Christiansted. Uh, had a couple of hills. So it was super fun. Loop back in, got in and switched to the run. And by all my training, everything, it was like I was a way better runner by default than everything else. So by the time I got on the run, it was like, how many people can I pass on the run course? So I just started to run and check everyone off like, all right, one, two, three you know, and just counting how many people I could pass before I got to the finish. Got to the finish and was like super excited. Uh, had a total blast and, you know, crossed the finish line, got my medal uh, and just was like super ecstatic, you know. So it sounds like to me, you were super confident as a first timer. I'm not sure if I was confident. It was just a matter of, you know, keep going. So the, the, the end of that is, you know, my family threw me a, a party and we pretty much invited any, anyone who looked like me who was at the race. We were like, hey, you know, family, because, you know, my folks hung out with their folks while they were racing. So by the time the race was over, they were fast friends. It was like, hey, everybody come over to our house and we're, have, we're having a party because Lloyd finished his try. And, you know, while we're there, you know, someone kindly said like, hey, man, you know, good job. But if you ever want to do another triathlon, you need to learn how to swim. <laughs> wow. It was like, you made a good attempt, but, you know, that was all heart and willpower. you got to learn how to actually swim if you're going to ever do... <laughs> another one of these uh, you know so once I got out of my feelings like wow that kind of hurt like I thought I did a good job then I realized like hey you know it was true I, I fought the water the whole time uh, that's why when I got out of the swim I was wiped out I was exhausted you know but I got out on my own power so it was like all good so yeah, it was it was a little bit of a mix. I, I was confident because I had done it, you know, enough in the pool, not open water, but enough in the pool where I felt like, okay, if I just keep moving forward, I'll get out. So do you mean to tell me that your first time swimming in open water for your first sprint race was the first time back in St. Croix? Yeah. 
So you had a lot of first in one day. I can see why you were wiped out and tired. <laughs> well, I mean, I grew up swimming, swimming in, in, in that body of water. But again, you know, when you're swimming in the islands, we swim for fun. You know, you swim out to a buoy, you swim out to a boat, you know, you swim to catch a ball and, you know, you're going back and forth. You're not necessarily swimming laps. You're not like, okay, let me do a 500 or a thousand or 250 on a repeat. You're going and you consider yourself a swimmer if you can go to the beach and safely swim back and forth and enjoy yourself and you're comfortable in the water versus, you know, what's your average hundred pace? <laughs> you know, I, I had no hundred pace. Right. And that's what I was trying to say. Basically, like it wasn't you didn't know what exactly you were doing. And swimming for fun is very different than swimming for technique. Correct. Correct. Right. So we're going to get to that. We're going to put a pin right there and we're going to come back to that. So you do your first triathlon in 2003, which was the St. Croix Sprint. But then 2004, you become a coach. What was it that allowed you to say, hey, I'm going from sprint to coach and was there anything in between that i'm missing out on so from 2003 um you know i took that advice that the guy gave me when he said hey if you want to learn how to if you're going to do another triathlon you need to learn how to swim so at that point that's when i went and i got swim lessons uh i went to a coach who was a total immersion swim coach and she taught me how to swim and i was so drawn to the technique because it was drastically different from you know the fighting of the water that I was I'd done in 2003 and you know when I went back to say I'm going to do a half Ironman in 2000 uh in 2002 to 2003 when I do a half Ironman in 2003 you know I'm no longer fighting the water my friends waiting for me at the finish line were like, out of the water were like, wow, yeah, you clearly improved <laughs> what you did from, you know, last year. Like, you know, you were really struggling in the sprint and now all of a sudden you're looking really great. You know, you're looking like all those other folks who come down here for the race. <laughs> oh, in just one year. In one year. So it was like, wow, okay. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, a scientist by training. So for me, I've always felt like if I know something good enough to teach someone, then I know it well enough for myself. So I then said, I need to know this even better. I need to know the techniques even more. Uh, so that's when I went on that path of how do I learn it good enough to teach someone, but really it's all just for myself, <laughs> for me to get better. Um, and then once I got good, you know, and my friends, my inner soul girls started to see like, yeah, we know Lloyd's no athlete. He's gone from non-athlete and now he's doing, you know, Ironman races. We'll listen. And it was like, hey, can you teach me how to do X, Y, and Z? Because we know it's all about the technique. It's not your skill set. It's clearly the technique. <laughs> so, you know, one friend would come, I'd say, sure, I can teach you because I've done it for myself. Here's how we do it. You know, that led to, well, hey, why don't you teach a friend of mine? They want to know how to do it. You're good at it. So then it, then that just opened up to, all right, well, since people I don't know are calling me, you know, let, let's, let's go ahead and, you know, get certified in these different things so that you can officially start coaching them on how to do it. Wow. I want to poke around total immersion in just a moment. However, I need to go back to something that you said. You went from sprint to half Ironman. So what, what made you feel like after doing one sprint that you could automatically just jump to a half Ironman? Well, at, at the time, they're really the Olympic distance really wasn't that prevalent or popular. Um, so you really had, you know, sprint races and then halves and then, you know, fulls. They had a few Olympic distances, but they weren't as readily available as they are, are now. So 
And again, the only place I was ever really planning to race was back at home in St. Croix. So since they had a sprint and a half, I didn't want to go back home and do the sprint again. It was like, okay, now if you've done the sprint, you got to go home and, you know, take one more step up and do the half. Okay. So we're here at the half. What was it like to do your first half as a semi-beginner, but still a beginner doing the half? The, the half was a lot more fun uh, than the sprint, <laughs> just because I, w- I was better prepared uh, going into the half. You know, the first, for the sprint, it was just making up as I go, um, you know, I'll swim a couple of days, bike, run. By the time I got to the half, I actually had like a plan. There was some, some, some history of what worked the previous year so now here's a good training plan let me follow the routine and I started to get a bit more familiar with building a plan for myself so I was way better prepared going into the half um, on the swim and the run because I've always liked to swim and run not so much bike <laughs> but going into the half was really exciting uh, because the St. Croix course it's known for as beauty and the beast so the bike course is ridiculously hard and the run course is challenging um it's so diff. the course is so difficult that at that time you could everyone use the Syncroy half ironman as a qualifier for kona world championship so mm-hmm. you could either do an ironman event somewhere around the world or you could do the Syncroy half ironman to qualify for kona it was that It was considered that challenging that the half, if you could do that half, they were like, yeah, you could could do world championships in Kona. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Um, So, you know, going into that one, the swim, you know, was a a bit longer uh, and we went further out into the ocean. Almost feel like if you're about to swim to another island before before the turn and then you head back in, uh, the bike course, like I said, it's super hilly, lots of climbs. Uh, so that takes it out of you. And, and the same thing for the run. But again, I was wet, I was a lot more prepared for it. So, um, and because it was a longer run, then I could pass more people on the run. So it became a matter of, okay, I know I was super slow on the bike, but now I've got way more real estate to try to, you know, close the gap on how many people can I pass on the, you know, in the first loop and then the second loop. Okay, I think there's beginning to be a pattern here. You like to pass people. That gives you like your mojo. It is. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's always it's always fun to to pass. I mean, there's there's always a trade-off. You know, if you're in the front, you know, then you're gonna be the one getting passed. So, you know, and again, in order for me to pass you on the run, that means you had to outswim me and outbite me. <laughs> so so <laughs> You know, there, there's always that twist. So if, if I'm passing a lot of people on the run, that just means a lot of folks beat me out the water and on the bike. But, you know, triathlon is all mental. So you've got to find find the way to view it to keep you motivated and, and moving forward. So that's that's how I think of it back then. I would have to agree that that's good. It's all mental and you just have to figure it out. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so... You finish your, your half, and now mm-hmm. you're coaching. You did the total immersion class that your coach taught you, and now you're coaching total immersion. Can you explain to those who are listening who may not know what total immersion is? Sure. So total immersion is a style of, of swim uh, developed by uh, Terry Laughlin. He, he was an exceptional swimmer and, and swim instructor who developed the concept uh, over years and years of him, uh, you know, fine tuning his skill set. Uh, and he came up with a series of, you know, he, he believed that anyone could become a really good swimmer. You didn't have to have the long history of, uh, you know, growing up swimming to become a good swimmer. How could you, he, so he figured out how do I take the best techniques, come up with new techniques to make sure that everyone can be a good good swimmer. And after years of research and trial and error, he, he 
put it all together and bottled it and called it Total Immersion, where the whole idea is focusing on getting swimmers to first be balanced in the water, then focus on being streamlined, and then using whole body propulsion. So if you're not balanced as a swimmer, then you, you hear all of the stories of, I feel like if I'm sinking, I'm fighting, I'm struggling in the water, uh, no matter what I do, it, you know, I work harder, but I really don't go anywhere. Uh, when you're not streamlined, that's when you have the sinking legs or you know, the arms moving like windmills or the kicks that's turbocharged that you know, by the time you get to the other end of the pool, you're totally gassed and you can't really keep, keep going. And then with whole body propulsion, I'm looking for the whole body to move forward versus just you swinging your arms, trying to pull yourself forward or moving the legs super fast, but not really getting in anything out of them. So we break it down into a number of various drills and concepts so that by the time you're done, you should be balanced, streamlined and whole body propulsion as you swim so that you're moving forward and working with the water versus having that survival instinct of survival where you're just fighting and trying to claw your way out to breathe, which, you know, if you're just trying to survive, that's okay. But if you're trying to swim uh, competitively, recreationally, or, you know, in a triathlon, that's really not the way you want to approach the swim. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So this makes me think about last year, you took a group of students, or I shouldn't say students, but you took a few team members from District Triathlon and you put them through a grueling, very grueling, <laughs> not that grueling, <laughs> workshop. So was that workshop hindsight total immersion? Yes, it, it was total immersion. That's the only technique that I teach. Wow, mine is blue. Okay, sorry. I say that because I was a part of that cohort. And it's really cool uh, to see how the swim stroke, and I grew up swimming as a young person, like I was on the swim team when I was younger. And pretty much what he described when he was saying about the, not necessarily fighting in the water, but just kicking more than you should, pretty much he really was telling me that my swim was trash, but not trash, right? He's laughing right now. So if you can see him, he's laughing because he would always tell me, he's like, you're swimming too hard. And I didn't get it until, until I was swimming. And I was like, I didn't feel like I was swimming. And he did. And he actually had to show me a video to make me believe that I was actually moving because I felt like I wasn't moving and I actually was getting more gains. So, wow, that is so, so cool. You, again, I'm bamboozled, man. So, so just so we're clear, no one said your stroke was trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we, what we did, what I did say is we can improve it. I mean, because again, with, with everyone is at, at a different level of where they are as swimmers. So, you know, even in your cohort, they had some folks who, you know, they would look over at your lane and were like, man, I'd give my right arm if I could swim like you, you know, but you were still like, hey, I want, I want gains, I want improvement, you know? So it's like, as swimmers, everyone always feels like, you know, I can do better or whatever the case is. So, you know, for you, there were just some hard um, wired techniques that you had that once we adjusted them, all of a sudden you start to get the gains that you were looking for without the wasted effort. So it's not a matter of not putting in the, the work, it's just making sure that you get the return on the investment for what you're putting in. Yes, he said hardwired. They were hardwired and I felt like I struggled, but I'm grateful that I, again, you just heard him, I wanted to improve. I'm still in this because I want to improve. And this is why Try Beginner's Luck exists. It exists because as long as we're in this sport, there is always an area that we can improve upon because you're never at a point where you have arrived. Even, and would you say, Lloyd, even with you doing, what, six Ironmans on six continents, there's still things that you're learning today? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I always advise all of my athletes, all of my clients, 
that triathlon is addictive. So before you dive in, just know that because once you do your first one, we're all chasing that perfect race where if I had the swim time from, you know, that one race in 2000 and whatnot, plus the bike split I had, you know, last week and that run I had from so-and-so race, oh, that would be the perfect combination of, 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 of time for me. <laughs> so even if you get two great uh, events, one might not be great. So you're like, oh man, I still could have gotten better if I had just done, you know, gone fast on the bike or the swim. So we're always chasing that, you know, that perfect combination of where the swim, bike and run all come together well on one day. So it just kind of keeps bringing you back until, you know, that happens. Wow. I would say, yeah. Let me ask you, okay, because my mind is going all over the place because you have so many nuggets and you have done so much and I want to be able to get in as much as I can in our short period that we have together. You went from sprint to half. And then did you jump straight into the Ironman lane or did you go back and you still do Olympics? Like what, tell me about that, your space and going into that. Sure. So uh, 2002 was my first sprint. 2003 was my first half. 2004 was my first full. So each, each year I progressed to the next distance. Um, and, and that's just how it went. And once I did my first full, I never looked back. Most of the races that I've done since 2004 till now have mainly been the full distance. Every so often, you know, I, I do a half. I think I've done maybe one or two Olympic distances when, when there was one here in, in DC you know, I was excited for a local race, so I, I signed up for, for that Olympic race. Uh, but in general, it, it's either going to be a half or a full. So I haven't done too many Olympic races over, the, over all of these years. All right. Let me just break this down for y'all. For those of you who are listening, the Ironman distance is 2.4 miles. It's a 112-mile bike, and it is a I almost said 56 mile run. No, 26.2 <laughs> mile run. Heck, I'm getting all twisted. So 140.2 uh, miles total. How did you know that was what your specialty was going to be? Because no one can do 27 Ironmans and not know, okay, I thrive at this distance. How did you know that that was a distance for you? Oh, um, hmm. Once I got through, I would say after I did the first Ironman, um, I started I started to talk to some other people, you know, and just in you know in the DC area, it's a small it was a small community at the time, um, and there there was an article I can't remember which publication that had it, and it started to describe, you know athletes in general like you know are you a short distance athlete are you a long distance athlete medium distance athlete and my cousin at who who was kind of helping me <laughs> navigate my athletic experience um you know we would I would always laugh with her because when I first started to run and train I was always miserable you know and she was always like super pumped up. So when we were doing a 5K, she was like, this is great. And I was like, 5Ks, this distance is just horrible. I don't, I'm not having fun. Running is not fun, you know? Then when I was like, okay, we, you know, I moved up in my training to get to a 10K uh, on my way to a half Ironman training. I was like, okay, this is, you know, five or six miles. Now we're starting to actually not be too bad. And she was like, oh man five miles is terrible. And I was like, it's not too bad. You know, then we got to like 10 miles and she's like, yo, I'm good. You are on your own. You know, I'm not running with you anymore. Call me. Just let me know you're back home safe. But I was like, this is everything after five miles was like, oh, this is where the run is at. 
this is, you know, the happy place that people talk about where, you know, runners high, all of that. But, you know, what miles one through five, I was never happy all of those years of running. It was just like, this is just not fun. So it's not until I crossed over it a little longer did it actually like, okay, I like this distance. And we came across an article that basically boiled down to, you know, do you want to get home and be happy in time, your workout in time for breakfast, brunch, lunch, or dinner? <laughs> you know, and my cousin was like, yeah, breakfast. If I'm home by breakfast, maybe brunch, I'm good. And me, I was like, yeah, I need to be out there till lunch or dinner. So, hmm. you know, from that reading, it was like, okay, I started to realize that the longer I was out there, I got into a groove, a rhythm, and it was like, this is an enjoyable experience versus the first few miles. So even to this day, you know, I don't like running less than five or six miles. If, if friends or anyone says, hey, let's go for a run, if we're, if we're doing, if they're talking about three to five, I'm not going to show up for the fun run. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> I'll be miserable the whole time. You know, if, if we're like, hey, we're six to 10, then I can have fun. Like, okay, I, I get into a groove, I warm up, I'm cool. And now we can stay all day and talk while we run and catch up and whatever it is. But, you know, those first three to five miles, I, I'm never in a happy place. Same thing with the bike ride. It's like those first 20, 25 miles, you know, they're never that enjoyable. I'm always like, man, you know, I could go home right now. Like my, my house is right there or the car is right there. Let's just turn around. But, wow. you know, once you get past 25, 30, it's like, well, you're here. You know, you might as well keep going. So, you know, once I figured that out, that, you know, the longer I went, exercising started to be fun. Then it was like, okay, I'm only doing things you know, above this distance so that exercising becomes fun. Otherwise, it just feels like a drain because I never get that runner's high or that, you know, those endorphins kicking in or any of that. It's just, eh. but again, you have to know where you fall. Again, like my cousin, you know, she's a hardcore breakfast. <laughs> if she's out longer, you know, be longer than, you know, time to get back for breakfast for a race, it's a no-go. Wow. I uh, well, okay. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard me say it in season one. You're hearing me say it again. There's a distance out there for everyone. Find what is your secret sauce and let that be, and you will be successful and thriving just like Lloyd, who has done 27 Ironman and Lone Courses across the world. And the first, let me say that again, African-American to finish six I mean, well, I guess six Ironmans on six different continents, including and Kona. So there's a distance out there for everybody. Before we go, Lloyd, you're a, you're a coach. And I need you to think with both hats, a coach and an athlete. What advice would you tell a beginner today with the knowledge that you have now? Have fun have fun. Um, as an athlete, uh, you know, there's so many resources available to you now. Uh, so I would find a village, find a group of people who are, are like-minded, who are interested in the sport that you're doing, and just connect with them. You can learn a lot from people who are currently in the sport. Um, I would then say, be mindful that all the advice you get doesn't necessarily apply to you. So you have to kind of put your thinking cap on like they used to say back in the day and start to discern between, you know, is that advice good for me or is it good for someone else? Because a lot of times if you just kind of go on the internet and, you know, into various social groups, you'll hear one athlete is like, hey, I swear by this, this is what I'm doing. And then you hear another athlete swearing like, hey, this is what I do, I swear by it. And you are kind of like, okay, let me do this, let me do that. And you're all over the place trying to figure out what works for you. So again, just take a little time to think it through to see, 
what advice people are giving you that actually applies to you so that you can use it. Because again, some, some tips may be great, but it doesn't apply. So just kind of use that uh, judgment while, while you're going through. And people often say, that's really good. So that's good advice. But people often say, if you race long enough, you will have a bad race. Have you ever had a bad race? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, my first race was, my first Ironman race was, you know, terrible. Terrible. I mean, my first Ironman race was a, a DNF. Um, I picked I picked Ironman Brazil uh, to do my, my first Ironman race because, again, I love traveling and I've used uh, the sport of triathlon to take me around the world. So, you know, a friend was like, hey, you know, there's an Ironman in Brazil. And I was like, I'm there. <laughs> so, you know, flew down to Brazil, signed up, did, you know, trained. I was totally ready. Um, and I got down there and it was cold. So the, the water temperature was ridiculously cold. And I'm a warm blooded person. I need warm water for my swims. Um, I didn't have a wetsuit, so I was able to borrow one from someone there. Uh, and it was a sleeveless wetsuit. I got in to swim and I just froze. It was so cold uh, and the buoys weren't properly anchored. So by the time I started to swim um, and try to do my first loop, the buoy was just kind of drifting off into nowhere. And I'm chasing the buoy, trying to get around and turn, <laughs> make my turn around the buoy. Uh, you know, came back for the first loop, super cold, and, you know, went out for the second loop. And of course, the time ran out while I was still out there. So, you know, then I had to get, um, you know, they had to send a the boat out to pick you up, you know, all those who didn't make the cutoff time and, you know, come back in. And, you know, for anyone who's never finished a race, you know, a DNF just hurts. It just kind of goes to your soul. Um, you know, it, it, it cuts deep, you know, all, all of us as adults, you know, getting into the sport probably have, you know, borderline type A, or type triple A personalities. You're successful in, you know, all other parts of your life. And now you're into the sport of triathlon and you expect that it should be the exact same sense of accomplishment and you haven't failed at anything in a super long time. <laughs> so, so to be faced with a failure as an adult in, you know, your hobby, it's, you know, it, it hurts. But again, you know, that was the turning point. Once I, you know, came to terms with that DNF and all that it entails, you know, I dusted myself off, got back to training, redoubled my efforts and, you know, signed up for the next one that year and crushed it. Bam, you heard it. He crushed it. And I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, last year, although I did finish, I just fought differently. You helped me through that time and you encouraged me and you were like Mashonda most of the people who you admire have DNF'd in some regards and uh, I've had to reposition what that was to me and what was what the success look like for me since then um, but it was really good to hear you talk to me about that and kind of coach me through that and coach me through like the low points you know because some people are riding with you while things are high but then when you things hit low you know I just remember you being there for me and talking to me you were like checking on me like you good are you good are you seriously good and you know it helped me come to some realizations and I know at the end of the year um, I did a podcast where I kind of shared some of those revelations and shared that. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, we got to go because we're almost coming up on our time. And what I've been doing at this season, so thank you so much for sharing. What I'm doing this season is just kind of bragging on my guest at the end of the podcast and before we go into our fun segment. And so I just want to reiterate who Lloyd is. Like Lloyd Henry, 27-time Ironman finisher, long course Ironman and long course finisher. And in 2016, becoming the first African-American to finish an Ironman on six continents plus Ironman World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. In addition to that, Lloyd is a sub three 
hour marathoner and has competed in numerous running events from 5K to ultra marathons, including Boston Marathon and Comrade Marathon in South Africa. Clearly, he likes to travel. He's also been running since 2002 and coaching since 2014. He is a form and techniques. Form and techniques are his focal points for his coaching. I can truly say after last year of only having a segment of being able, it's like a cohort that he's trying to was trying to do back in 2021. He is about the form and the technique. So if you're looking for a coach and you want that aha moment, Lloyd is a good coach for you. Whether it is gliding through the water with ease and feeling like a fish in the water and feeling the gravity pull you, he is a great coach. He also helps his clients swim, improve their stroke, and compete in triathlons, moving from couch to 5K, finishing their first marathon, qualifying for Boston, or hearing those famous words, you are an Ironman. He's a native of St. Croix. He has a BS in biology, which I did not know that. He's also an avid scuba diver, snowboarder, gardener, and here is the kicker, ladies and gentlemen, because I don't think anyone would have saw this coming. He is a cruising market basket weaver. Child, listen, I had to ask, what is that? But if you see that little basket up there, that's what he makes. Who knew Lloyd was crafty? Whatever. I'm just so grateful to have you with us. Now we're going to move on to our rapid fire questions. Really quick, quick answers, short answers, and then um, we'll get out. Favorite part of triathlon? It changes, but right now, uh, the bike. The bike. Awesome. What is your favorite thing after a race? Beer, wine, soda, or water? Waffle. Oh, those are my choices. Oh, you can add your own choice. Oh, Waffle House. That's right, because you like the pecan waffle. All day. If, All if, day. You got one, if you got one in the state where I'm racing, I'm going to find it. I got you. Since you do long course, do you pee on your bike or not? No, I get off my bike and pee. That's so interesting. All the men say get off the bike and all the ladies like we pee on the bike. We get easy, but I love that. All right, cool. Um, do you listen to music, podcast? What do you do when you're on those long rides? I, I solve all of my problems. That's so a good no answer. music, nothing. I just figure, figure out life. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't even know how to come back after that. There you have it. You have heard from Lloyd with On Point Fitness. Where can people find you, Lloyd? Uh, you can find me on Facebook at On Point Fitness, uh, Instagram at On Point Fitness Coach, and On Point Fitness on Twitter. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you again so much, Lloyd. I'm Mashonda, and whenever you try beginner's luck, you always win. I'm Mashonda, and I'm out. Peace. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. We need your help so we can continue to try at TBL. So for more information on where you can find and subscribe to this podcast, visit www.trybeginnersluck.com. And don't forget, whenever you try beginner's luck, you always win.